This is going to be Joel chapter 3, verse by verse. And we're going to look at the topic, why Joel isn't outdated. A lot of people believe the amount of prophets are outdated books, but I'm going to prove to you that this is very relevant for today and way ahead of our time. Number one, the whole thing speaks of the future. So Joel 3 and verse 1, For behold, in those days... And in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice the great phrase, in those days. This has to do with a future time when the Lord is going to restore Israel. He is going to give them double what they had. Notice the phrase, bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Compare this with Job 42.10 where it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So just as when he turned the captivity of Job and gave him twice as much as he had, he's going to do the same thing with Judah and Jerusalem. But you know the story of Job. He lost everything. But just like Israel, he has restored double what he had before. That is the future of Israel. They haven't been replaced by the church. The church is a whole other group of saints. Every Jew that gets saved today gets put into the church where there is neither Jew nor Gentile. However, there is going to be a remnant of believing Jews who will get the land when Jesus Christ comes back to deliver them. As that verse says in Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So the Lord is coming back with a vengeance. And he is going to demolish all of the God-haters. He even has a river dried up so that the nations can gather together against him faster. As it talks about in Revelation 16, 12. And when he is done trampling them under his feet, the rema remaining nations are gathered together for a judgment. And that's why it says in Joel chapter 3 and verse 2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So the nations that helped the Jew will go on into the kingdom and the ones who didn't help the Jew are cast into the lake of fire. And you can read about that in Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46 that's the judgment of the nations but this book of joel is not an outdated book because it speaks of the future it speaks of that when god will restore israel and joel the next thing that joel speaks of those things that are very relevant for today joel 3 and verse 3 it says and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So notice this verse about slavery. What does this remind you of? Sex slavery. Uh, these perverted pieces of trash today are going around picking up people's kids and selling them off to be sex slaves. These people are full of the devil. This is the about the most evil you can become, but this... Same thing happened with Israel. The wicked cast lots for the people, for God's people Israel. They gave a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine. It's slavery, but it's coming right back on the enemies of God. In Joel 3, 4, it says, Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? So Tyre and Zidon and the coasts of Palestine will get none of Palestine because it's the Lord's land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is going to recompense the people and nations who went after that land, which wasn't their land. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. The Lord does the same thing for believers today. If you get away from the Lord, then he will raise up an adversary against you, whether it be someone at work or even your wife. 
then he'll just end up punishing them for messing with you. He did the same thing with Israel. So you see how relevant Joel is for us today and yesterday and way back then and even in the future. So Joel 3, 4, and 5. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. So notice the Lord considered the material possessions of his people to also be his. Everything you have is the Lord's. Everything on this earth belongs to him. Psalms 50 and verse 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. It's all the Lord's. Satan is only the God of this world because the Lord let him be. Everything is the Lord's. He allows Satan to give out kingdoms. He allows certain men to rule kingdoms. But this earth is the Lord's. Now Joel 3, 6, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. So just like they sold the Lord's people, it's going to come right back on them. Verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place where you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah. And they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. So now the Lord is going to mock the Gentile nations who will come up against him at the second coming. Joel 3, 9. Proclaim you this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let the men of war draw near. Let them come up. So in Joel 2, we, we also refer to the mighty men. And the devil's mighty men are going to hide in the dens and rocks of the mountains. These, the, mighty, the devil's mighty men are nothing compared to God's mighty men. He says in verse 10, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. So the Lord says, go ahead and talk about how strong you are, but you're really weak. You see all these world's strongest man competitions and all those guys on the History Channel trying to show off their strength. That's nothing compared to God. It's laughable. He says, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Tither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. So he wants them to get together. And as I said, a river has dried up for them to get together faster. Men always join hands against Jesus Christ. And these wicked armies have to get together against him. It wouldn't be fair otherwise. It still isn't fair. But this happens at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But also notice in verse 11, he says, Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. That is the Lord's mighty ones, which he referred to in the last chapter. The ones who run like mighty men. Verse 12, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. So he's going to judge them in battle and at the judgment of the nations. Joel 3.13 Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, with, for their wickedness is great. So this refers to when the Lord Jesus Christ on a white horse will stomp the enemy into the, and their blood will be up to the horse bridles. Revelation fourteen nineteen and 20. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. So you see that sickle, the same as in Joel 3, 13. And cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even into the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So you see that match there, Revelation 14 and 19 through 20, with Joel 3, 13. Now Joel 3, 14, multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You're going to see multitudes of enemy soldiers at the second coming. 
because it, as it says in Revelation 16, 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Not only the kings of the east, but also the northern army. That it talks about in Ezekiel 38, 15 through 16, where it says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people Israel, as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, but the heathen, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Look at that multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision in Joel 3.14. Once again, this is referring to the judgment of the nations. Now, Joel 3.15, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That'll match what you read in Matthew 24. If you look at Matthew 24, 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So we're obviously talking about the second coming. Shall the sun be darkened? Notice the sun's darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the Lord is going to appear in the clouds with thousands of his saints behind him on white horses. And he's going to wreck the heathen and then judge the nations. And verse 16 in Joel 3 says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Imagine being a lost sinner and hearing the voice of Almighty God. Do you remember back in chapter 2 when he said, The Lord shall utter his voice before his army. This is the army of the saints coming back with the Lord. As it says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Job 40 and verse 9 says, Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Have you ever been sitting in your house and all of a sudden you hear a loud boom and the thunder just made you jump out of your seat? That's as close as you get to hearing the Lord's audible voice. Notice it said the Lord shall roar out of Zion in verse 16. That's because when he comes back, he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jeremiah 25, 30, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Joel 3, 17, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall be no strangers pass through her anymore. This is referring to the millennial reign when Jerusalem will be holy and no strangers are going to pass through anymore. You're not going to have to worry about any wicked men passing through. Joel 3, 18 and 19. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine. And the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. That's one of the things the Lord hates, is shed, hands that shed innocent blood. So Egypt will be a desolation, and Edom will be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah. See how relevant it is for today? There's all kinds of people. Their hands are shedding innocent blood. And the Lord's vengeance, His violence is going to be against them for what they're doing to innocent people. And in this situation, for messing with God's people, God messes with those Gentile nations 
The Gentile nations are nothing in the eyes of God. America is nothing in the eyes of God. Joel 3, 20 and 21. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. How could you read the Old Testament and not believe that the Lord is going to restore Israel? If you read the book of Joel and you tell me that the church replaces Israel and that Israel will not be restored, then you make the book of Joel very unrelevant for today. You're just not taking things literally. The, this book is completely ahead of its time, way ahead of anything that's out there right now. It's ahead of anything on YouTube or on Facebook or anything that you're seeing. The things in this book haven't even happened yet. It's far from outdated. It was relevant when it was written. It was relevant a thousand years ago. It's relevant now. And it's ahead of its time because it tells us the future. So this has been why Joel isn't outdated.